It is that resiliency. It is that when you get knocked down, how do you get back up? You know, it's like Michael Bloomberg got fired from, I guess it was Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs early on. They said he was never going to be a success, right? How many people, I remember Richard Gere. I remember early on in my career hearing that Richard Gere was told by a modeling agency that he just didn't have it. Okay. <laughs> it's like, okay. how do they know? Right. You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. My guest today is Leslie Jane Seymour. She is a media entrepreneur and the founder of Covey Club a club for lifelong learners, which is awesome. Leslie was the editor-in-chief of Chief of More Magazine, the leading lifestyle magazine for women over 40 with a readership of 1.5 million. And before taking over More, she was the editor-in-chief for Marie Claire and Red Book, YM and beauty director of Glamour and a copywriter and senior editor at Vogue. And now she's Can't on you tell? her- uh, <laughs> yeah, right? She, she's on her next act, and we're going to talk to her today about it ain't over till it's over. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's my mantra. Yeah, I love it. So, Leslie, let's start with what does a woman of value mean to you? Well, I think we're all women of value, and I think, you know, having worked with women my entire career, um, if we were equal out there, I discovered this the other day. I was like, you know what? If women were truly equal, you wouldn't have had a career because I spent my whole career trying to convince women and the rest of the world that they did have value and that they were as valuable or more valuable than the men around them who had created this world that we're in. And it's been a continual fight, you know, from small things to large things, small things like, you know, why do we pay more to have our dry cleaning done? all the way up to, you know, getting women into work and getting them paid properly. So women of value, value is a big word for us. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that our children's generation won't struggle with that word. I'm hoping they will know their value and that they will assert their value. Um, and I find a lot of these young women are very strong about their value. They're not going to take crap from anybody. And I love it. They don't take crap from me either or their (laughs) their mothers, you know, but I think, you know, maybe this next generation, we're not, they, they feel it more internally. They, you know, they feel they can contribute. They know they can contribute They're They don't want, they're not going to put up with this stuff that, you know, that we put up with. You fought for the rights for your daughter to have this, this ability to, to speak up and, Yes. I love, uh, yeah. I mean, I love, I love this perspective because I never thought about it, but my whole career is based on the same thing. And it's like, we would have been out of it. We'd have to be electric <laughs> engineers or something. Like, right. It's going to be a, a lost art, like a lost art of representing half the population that's considered a minority. I mean, yeah. I right? mean, hopefully, hopefully. Wouldn't I guess that be the great? True, right. The true Work ourselves of, out of a whole job, of the whole career, right? Exactly, exactly. And that's the goal is to have everybody be valued. Right. I'm not sure it's going to happen so fast. I think even in our generation of children, of our daughters, and I also have grown daughters, they still struggle. You know, there's still a lot of expectations that women do the majority of the domestic work. I mean, we had during I COVID, right? That. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm hearing that. But I'm telling you, I do see change and I'll tell you where I see it. I see it in things like what's happened to Andrew Cuomo with these young girls who Mm. worked for him, who turn around and said, oh, no, you don't. And it's the stuff that I had. I lived with that. I had male bosses. They said all kinds of horrible things to me. They said, I mean, they were inappropriate with half the staff. What were you going to do? Quit your job, leave, lose your salary, be blackballed out of an industry? We just put our heads down and we ignored it. Mm. And that's why these older guys don't get it. They don't get that the world has changed. Now, maybe it's a small tip of the spear, I'm hoping, of these young women that are going to say, no, you're not going to put your hand on my thigh when we're at lunch. Yeah. You know? So... It, yes, it's not going to go away overnight for sure. And, um, and we do see that, you know, 
I think that it really comes out. It's funny. I was talking to my girlfriend um, whose daughter is in her 30s, just had her second child. And um, great husband. She's a psychiatrist. The husband fully employed in the financial area. And they're having this, you know, it's this it's like repeat of, oh, my God, the men are like, you know, it's your child. Yes, you know, call on me when you need the help instead of just jumping in and doing things and knowing what to you know and assuming that they can do things too. And, and I'm like, oh my God, I thought that had changed like that, you know, and I had a wonderful husband who was, you know, believed in equality and all this stuff. And then suddenly when I had a baby, it was like, well, that's yours. Like, you know, I'll help out. I'll babysit. Like, you know, <laughs> right. and I think a lot of it was fear. And I think a lot of it was, um, you know, that they felt that we knew more than they knew. I hope that this will change. I, I really do. And I think, I just think there's, they're more willing to speak up. I don't know about you with your daughters, but my daughter's very outspoken. And um, we were just such different parents. I had the, you know, 1950s authoritarian parent who, you know, you just zipped it. You know, that was it. And, you know, as you, I don't know if you had this problem, but the beginning of the conversation with my daughter from day one was no, you know, I thought she was going to be a prosecutor. <laughs> it's like, you know what, you're going to have a great future as a prosecuting <laughs> lawyer. There's going to be nobody who escapes any kind of any, with any crime at all. She ended up as she's studying to be a dentist, but it's oh. pretty funny. They were just very different. I don't know. Was your daughter more outspoken than you? Um, in some way, I was pretty outspoken. Oh, you I were? A, okay. I had a big mouth. I was quiet. I was like uh, very quiet in school. Mm -hmm. Didn't raise my hand, mostly because I didn't want to be judged and be wrong. I wanted to be perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I realized now why I was so quiet. But my mother was much stronger than my dad. Like she, she had a big mouth, but she was more aggressive than assertive. And I knew like, mm -hmm. I didn't like that, but I looked up to her because she graduated college and then she went on wow. for her master's and her doctorate. Wow. And so she, and she reinvented herself many times too, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. So I looked to her with admiration on those fronts, mm. but when it really came to uh, important issues, she mm -hmm. did not speak up. And in mm -hmm. fact, we've had many conversations about that because she knows that's one of the major parts of my work is the focus of helping people communicate more effectively and right. set boundaries. And she says, I wish I had the courage to do what you did mm -hmm. and what you do in your life. So that, that was big, you know, to mm -hmm. have her say that to me. And yes, I have trained my daughters to speak up. And I think because this is my specialty, they don't always want to. <laughs> it's almost let's rebel against mom and not right, do Right, whatever it is, right. <laughs> We're just going to be submissive just to exactly. make you mad. <laughs> that happened to me when my daughter was, God, she was four. No, she was a little older than that. She was in grammar school and she was following this girl who I just didn't know what this girl was a queen bee, right? And I was trying to coach my daughter into don't follow this queen bee who was kind of naughty. And, um, but I couldn't figure out, she wasn't that exceptional. She was just like bossy and then sort of ran the whole schoolyard and all that stuff. And I remember her, she was in the back seat. She was still in a, you know, in, in the back seat. So she had to be fairly little. And I said, you know, what you need to do is you need to be a leader. You don't want to follow. You want to be a leader. That's what women do. You know, don't follow anybody. Be yourself. And then I hear this little voice in the back. Um, she says, but I like to follow. And I'm like, <laughs> like, what have I done wrong? What do you mean you want to follow? Now she's not like that. But I was like, oh, my God, she wants to follow. What did I do wrong? So. That's funny. No. Yeah. I mean, and following is okay sometimes, but sometimes, yeah. Right. I like to follow at points. I definitely like to follow right. at points. But not to be a sheep and not to mm -hmm. let other people boss you around and take away your power is really right. the thing, right? And right. So it's, you know, when in the interpersonal relationships and also at work, you know, it's just 
very mm-hmm. important to assert yourself. And mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a big advocate for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Leslie, let's talk a little bit about that pivotal moment um, where you stepped more fully into your value. There are so many pivotal moments for me. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to find my career very early. I wanted to be a writer, so I knew that. I wanted my voice to be heard. I, As I said, I grew up in a very authoritarian family where I was just told to zip it. And I think my writing was my subversive way of, you know, getting my story out, like, you know, in Russia during the Soviet Union. <laughs> that was my way out. And um, when I found that I could actually tell my story and tell other people's stories, that was a big awakening for me and that other people would listen and other people were moved by that, that you could move people and change people. Um, So, you know, working in corporate life was great. I'm a chameleon, I can go either way. I like like the structure, Um, but it, it got to the point where I really didn't like You know, I had people above me, men above me telling me what to do for a women's magazine. They didn't even know who the people were on the cover. And um, they were telling me who to put on cover. I mean, like it was completely insane. They didn't didn't even know who the women were. And they would say things like, let me ask my wife. Yeah, (laughs) I know. And, um, and that's when I decided, when they decided to close more, I had run four women's magazines, which is really fun. I mean, I have to say it was, it's a shame that the profession is dying because it really was, I call it Hollywood for non-actors. Hmm. And you get to do all the things that a famous Hollywood actor would get to do, walk the red carpet, travel first class, go to the collections meet heads of state. I mean, you know, like report on things you, I mean, you get to do all this stuff, but you don't have to get on stage and do all that awful stuff that I can't (laughs) even imagine. So when that closed, I was in the process of getting my degree up at Columbia in uh, sustainability. I thought I would move over from publishing. I didn't want another publishing job. It had gotten to be very sad. Every, instead of going up, 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 which was the whole history of my my career, which was, you know, we were selling more every month. We were this, we were that, you'd be celebrating. It became this horrible decline of firing people and asking people to do more than their job and not give them compensation. And and I'm not talking about a struggling startup like mine. I'm talking about multi-billion dollar corporations telling women that they should work for free on the weekend Mm. because they don't want to pay for the internet or whatever they didn't want to pay for. Um, so I said, you know, I want to do this again. And, um, I thought I would segue over into the beauty, um, industry in sustainability. Cause I said, my, my sector is dying, which was publishing and magazines. Where can I go to a sector? Can I segue into a sector that's not dying, but is increasing. And I had originally gone to college to be a marine biologist down at Duke. I'd switched over my junior year to be an English major, just because I was really struggling um, in the sciences. I didn't have the grounding that a lot of these guys had. I'd been in a fairly old fashioned women's school. And so I didn't, I didn't have the three years of chemistry and I was an okay science student back then, but a really good writer and English student. So I switched over. Luckily I was able to make a fabulous career out of um, the English background. And then I thought, let me go back. I've always loved science. I've always loved the environment. And the environment had now, you know, marine biology had come together with business to become sustainability. Sustainability is, sustainability management is where are the win-wins between business and the environment, right? You've got to make these changes. Not everything is impossible, but you have to think of things in a different way. So it was a wonderful thing. I thought I would segue over and they pulled the plug on, more magazine two years early. I was taking courses at night. I was, you know, going as fast as I could, but they, they were, they finished more. I thought I would sort of work it out so that there'd be a little, you know, just handoff. So I literally had a, you know, my readers came to me on my social media and said, do something else for us. And I thought I, you know, I listened to enough entrepreneurs um, when I was doing more because more had a lot of entrepreneurship because a lot of women were being pushed out of corporate. 
And I thought, okay, let me see what I can do. I don't know what it is, but here, let, you tell me what you want. And I'll see if I can create it. So I literally made a survey, 54 questions, 627 people took it to the end. I took their ideas. I made a map. <laughs> I ran with that. That was it. I took my severance pay and I said, let me make that, you know, pay for whatever this thing is. If it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll go the sustainability route. So I literally that April when they closed the magazine, I sat down at my dining room table and it was like, okay, I have to do research into women in the Congo and domestic violence there. I was taking a really interesting um, course about women in cities or I can learn MailChimp. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, that was my life for two years. And um, it was great. I mean, I, I have two different sides of who I am. I like the science part. I like the, the writing and communication part. So, um, and I, and going back to, to school as an adult, if, if you're, if anybody listening is wondering about that and wondering, will I get something out of it? Should I do it? I will say it was the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. And because you learn such a different way as an adult and you appreciate everything as an adult and you just, you know, part of it is that you're not distracted. I mean, you know, I'm surprised I learned a damn thing when I was, you know, 18 because I was spending the whole time across the table going, does that girl like me? Does he like me? Is he going to yeah. ask me? I don't think I paid attention. I mean, I was just so distracted, right? And now as an adult, I'm in there to learn and I'm paying a shit ton of money <laughs> and um, I'm going to learn. And I would see these kids next to me because we, when there was age range, you could go all the way up into the sixties like me, or you could be in your twenties in these grads, grad classes. And there were some kids sitting there on their Facebook pages. And I was like, I'm going to write to your parents and tell them you're on <laughs> Facebook. And um, it was just so delicious. And for me, it wasn't the sustainability stuff that I moved into this, but all the tech. I learned more about tech from being with those 20 year olds and in these classes where they would just say, okay, we're all gonna jump on Slack or we're all gonna be like, what is Slack? <laughs> right, what's it? <laughs> like, where is it? Do I, you know, it's like, I mean, I was lost and it taught me how to, you know, just to jump in and learn how to do all this stuff. And, and then a lot of the kids taught me stuff and it was really fantastic. So I highly, 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 highly recommend. And it doesn't have to, you don't have to go back and get a master's. You can go back and get a jewelry degree at your local high school. I did calligraphy at, at the local high school, all that stuff. Can anything that you are thinking about or that you had an interest in Go back and do it as an adult. Do it as a, and pick up a course on it. You have no idea where that's gonna lead you. I mean, I know people for whom the jewelry class at the high school, they left publishing and now they're running a full-fledged, you know, jewelry business that does very, very well from a high school course. Wonderful. Well, I, I love how your brain developed and where you pivoted because a lot of people feel very stuck in life. Yes, and I think do. this is just such an important conversation because yeah. your life didn't take a straight trajectory. You know, it wasn't a straight course and most people's lives are not. And I think that's a really important thing for people to know. And also that your sustainability work, your degree or, you know, your coursework didn't end in a career in sustainability, mm -mm. but it gave you so much. And I think that we often go in with one goal and then it keeps us stuck because we feel like a failure if we don't reach it. And I'm still looking for, you know, I moved to New Orleans right after I got my degree. And my idea with sustainability is somewhere I'm going to plug myself in in a volunteer way because it really means something to me. But I'll do that, you know, as long as Covey's going, I'll. I'll plug myself in some other way. But I, I agree, and you should not feel like, you know, that's wasted. You have to kind of look at it as just, I'm telling you, getting your brain working in the old academic way. It's like now if I want to know, I'm trying to think of what I did. There was something I had to research recently, and I can't remember what it was. But it was something about the Covey business I really needed to know. Oh, it's coming up. I have to figure out. I had somebody say to me, why don't you, you know, like really boost up the 
newsletter part of what you do. That could be, because I have to figure out we're three years in, we need to scale, we need to make more money. And they said, you know, look at, you have your assistant do a white paper on the newsletter business because it's really rocking, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, I want to have her do it. I'll do it because I want the research. I want to, I like doing research. And I thought to myself, you know, like after having to do the, I did one course, which was, I had to come up with a sustainable business. I had to pick one of four countries. I had to create a sustainability business. I had to fund it. I had to create um, spreadsheets for how you'd fund it and, you know, how you get around governmental controls. And I had to do that in Cambodia from here, you know, sitting here all done on line. And I remember when I went, it was a required course. And I remember when I went in there, I thought, I didn't even know what this guy is talking about. It was, <laughs> he was, it was, it was energy and sustainable development. I mean, the first four courses, I was like, I didn't even know what he's talking about. By the end, my brain, it was like bubble gum. It had been stretched in so many different directions. And when I turned in that paper, I was like, you know what? I could, if I had a $10,000 investment, I could start that business over there. Cause I knew everything I needed to know. And I thought, yeah, white paper on, on the uh, newsletter business, <laughs> get that done in a weekend, you know, <laughs> but it, those things that you can apply to your, whatever you're doing are not lost and no, they're not. opening your brain, opening your brain. There is a different type of thinking that goes on in academia than in the business world, right? Those two are not incompatible, but we drop the other one because we think, oh, that's what we do when we're 20. And yes, we read things as adult and blah, 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 but there's this whole other analytical thing that you can get your brain started on again and it feels really good and bring those two together with whatever you're doing or you're gonna do, and it's really powerful. I so agree. I, I think everything we do, every everything we're exposed to can make its way into our business, into our conversations, into our lives. Right. And none of it is wasted. And no. I, I think people t tend to look at things in a, such a linear way. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, this was a waste of time. This was a waste of time. No. And none of it is a waste of time. Nothing, nothing's no. a waste of time at all. No. And especially and if as we get older, it's so important to keep your brain plastic and flexible. I also, like I, I got into coaching, not knowing how to run a business, a sustainable business. I knew how to run businesses. I had many of them, but I had to learn technology just like you did. I had to mm -hmm. learn how to update my website, how to create a newsletter, how to do MailChimp at first. And now I'm on Entreport. It's a whole other system that's very mm -hmm. complex. My brain now knows how to do this, but mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do any of it. And mm -hmm. so when, when I have clients who say to me, oh, I just, I can't even get, keep track of email or oh, you sent me a Google doc, where do I find it? And it, week after week, it's like, Right. Just bookmark it. What does that mean? Bookmark. I oh, know I know. I know. It's a, <laughs> right. I call it the, I call it the, it, it's really a tech bubble that we're on. You and I are on the tech bubble. And I saw this at the magazine. There were women who were five to 10 years older than me, who, when we were handed the website, the website and magazines went back and forth between ownership, between the editors and chiefs. And then the company was going to own it. Like nobody could figure it out. This happened at every corporation. It was they, they were going to do it all from some place with nobody and some guy was going to run, you know, 24 sites and just post garbage and everybody was going to come to it. This was the beginning of, and then they went, oh no, like maybe the editors of the magazines know the voice and they know what people are interested in. Maybe we'll give it back to them. So it would go back and forth. But there were people in my, even at, at Moore who were, you know, maybe 10 years older than me who decided they were never going to learn any of this. They were done with it. Tech was not going to be part of their life. The internet was not, they were just on that edge. And, you know, it was their opportunity to learn something new and they didn't want it. Yeah. And um, it makes it harder. Um, we find with Cubby, you know, one of the funny things, and I'm, you know, I'm technically, I call it technologically open. <laughs> um, I'm not great at it by any means, but I'm open to it. But a lot of times, 
we laugh because I have a, a millennial um, assistant and we're like, and I'm like, so so-and-so can't get this. And she goes, okay, I know I've showed them five times. <laughs> it's like, they just don't want to learn. And if you don't want to learn, you're going to be hampered. It's just, that's the way it is. You have to learn the basics. Like even if you, your life will be, you can't ignore this where we are. So there's so many great tools out there if people yeah. are open to learning and really having open. that, right, the growth mindset is, is everything. But that, don't you think that Sandy growth mindset is the whole thing to aging? Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you, absolutely. if you don't, and you can cultivate it. I mean, every bit of reading that I've done says you can cultivate a growth mindset. You can learn to open your mind up. And um, if you have your mind open to all the amazing things that you can do as you get older, and of course, then you see all the studies that show that people who are engaged in aging and positive about it, they live longer, they're less likely to get disease, all kinds of stuff. It's an amazing time to have the time to learn stuff. That's what I, I think is great, you know? I agree with you wholeheartedly. Look, my mom is 89. She has an iPhone. She knows how to text. She knows how to Zoom. She took classes while we were in isolation during pandemic. She lives alone. She still drives. She lives alone. Yeah. Holy moly. Wow. She's extremely independent. Wow. And but she's she's open. She's open yeah. to figuring things out. I mean, she'll screw up a lot. Like she'll, sure. you know, she'll need the Netflix uh, password eight five, you know, 85 times. But right. She she's willing to do it. And I think right. the willingness and the fact that she is still connected socially, emotionally, and technologically really opens your world instead of closing it up, which is what most people do. Yes. And you do see that. And it's really interesting what we were saying earlier about some people who are stuck um, in Cubby Club. You know, I've had to do my little avatars. And one of the avatars is stuck. And there are some people, and it's interesting because we have these coaching calls. Um, and this morning, one of the stuck people finally got to the point where she was saying that she went into therapy and figured out this one thing has been standing in her way. And I was like, oh my God, she's going to be unstuck. It's incredible. <laughs> I mean, it's been a year and a half of hearing the same thing over. And I just thought, what do you do if you're stuck? But I guess being around all these people who are moving, um, she actually finally took control of this thing. And wow. I was blown away because I thought, well, she's just going to be stuck and I can't help her. And look at that, a year and a half into it. And she is going to attack this thing and she will move beyond it. And um you can change. And that is the wonderful, even if you're stuck, if you get in the right, I think you have to be with the right people and you have to be with other people who don't think being stuck is the end and yeah. that you can find your way out of being stuck. You have to recognize you're stuck. She, she finally did like a, in a year into it. She realized she was stuck. She was saying the same thing over and over. And then she did something about it. And I was so blown away because, well, we all know those people. We had those, you know, people can be stuck at any age. And, you know, all, all those girlfriends we had, who went over the same old story over, 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 like I finally got rid of those ones. I was tired of the story, you know, but to be older and to realize that you can still control how you approach things. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to it. Absolutely. People need to hear stories of unstuckness and yes, that yes. there is there is hope for anybody if you are willing to recognize the stuckness, like you said, get surround yourself with people who are positive and who are unstuck, you know, yes. and, and get yes. the right support. So she, you know, yes. there are fears and there are beliefs that we carry yes. with us. And we right. we have to look at those in order to really get to that next get to that next level in our lives and I see it every day in my coaching yes. you know it's like amazing to see people who have attracted toxicity in their life on yeah. every level both yes. romantic relationships friendships yes. work environment right. I mean I, 
there was a woman who she had she was just trusting of everyone. She just right. thought, you know, people are good. And so she has, was running an office where people were embezzling. She had oh. heads of, I mean, it was terrible. She really was in debt. She was, oh, my so, goodness. you know, she had to change everything. And she had been married to a man who was a narcissist who had mm. taken advantage of her good nature. And she learned through working with me how to improve her office how to, how to really ask the right questions when you're interviewing. I mean, there's so many things we can do to prevent ourselves from being duped, from repeating patterns, you repeating know, over patterns. and over and over. Repeating right. patterns. I mean, you know, look, I'm a veteran of 25 years of deep therapy. <laughs> Until you are aware of patterns and aware of the grip that patterns have on you, and until you're aware that the patterns you repeat actually have a positive outcome for some part of you that wants to keep telling that same story of how I'm always duped or how I'm always, you have to get, you have to, get to that. And if you don't, or if you're too afraid to look at that, you know, that's, that's the thing that just really drives me nuts is all these people are, you know, like, oh, it's weak to go into therapy. Like, actually, it's not. That's no. confronting your stuff. Confronting your crap is really terrifying. <laughs> and um, actually just swinging with the old stuff is easy. Yeah. It's, you know, just hiding your head and continuing to be miserable is easy. Confronting it's hard. And, and you know, that's part of it. But, you know, what's really interesting, Sandy, is because I came out of the therapy world, and I understood the value of that. But what I didn't like is there was no, nothing that moved you forward. It was just all backward looking. Yes, you have to understand some of your motivations, all that stuff. But there was really nothing moving you forward. And then when I got out of um, corporate, to, I started getting surrounded by coaches and all that stuff. I was highly skeptical. I was like, oh, coaching is the next real estate. Like yeah, people I know who should not be coaches are coaches, <laughs> right? They can barely handle themselves. Um, but then there are really fabulous coaches out there. And what I realized, it's the second part of therapy, which is the therapists deal with the motivation and what happened and what, how you got here. But the coaches, what I love is they're, they're focused on how do we move you out of that? Like, you know, the car wheel just spinning and spinning. The coach is the person in the back shoving the car out of the hole. <laughs> and, you know, it's good to know why the wheel spinning, you drove into the snow and you shouldn't have, and you should have put a snow tire on and you didn't and blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> how do you get out of that? And yeah. that is very useful when you're older, even if you haven't done a ton of therapy, it can still move you forward though. I highly recommend if you know nothing about your motivations, you might want to do both, but they do have different, um, different benefits. And um, I highly recommend that for women so and men searching for that second half um, and trying to move forward. Um, I think it's, I'm not a coach, so I'm not pushing any coaching, <laughs> but um, I do think if you find the right people, it can be life-changing. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really what motivated me to become a coach. Mm -hmm. I had gone to therapy a lot and I kept saying, what do I do? Just right now, what do I do? They won't tell you. And they're they're like, like, that's not my job. I don't know. I'm like, no. I was a what do I do kind of person. Like I wanted to move forward, right? Me too. I had, I can see that. And, you know, and so I just said, I, I want to do something that's going to really change people's lives. I want to give them the tools that they, like they know they didn't speak up enough, for example. Well, how do I speak up? Oh, right. there are actually scripts and tools and ways to process right. my feelings and needs. And right. oh, right. And because I see, I see it so much. Like if you watch any reality show on relationships and you see people saying, oh, just stop doing that. <laughs> or yeah. just, just mm. stop it. Mm. Um, yeah, or don't, don't have conflict in this way. Well, what do I do instead? I don't right. know. And right. so if you've been hardwired to do something your whole life and nobody's telling you how to break that pattern, you will continue to, to go back to that because it's safe. What you're comfortable it, with. Yeah. My, very, my very first therapist said something to me I will never forget. And it was probably the second or third time I saw him. And he said, if you grew up with shoes that pinched, when you take them off, your feet are going to hurt. Mm -hmm. 
And it's such a, of course, you totally understand what that means. Yeah. And it's what you grew up with, what you got comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you see it all the time with dating. I bet. Oh my God. You know, they, they get into one toxic relationship after the next. And it's because they grew up with toxicity. They grew up with a horrible home environment and that feels familiar. And so they keep going back to it, even though it's painful, it's familiar. And they just, and then when somebody shows up, who's, who's together and secure and treats them well, it's like, ew, uh, that's not, that's not enough for me. You know, there's no right. drama in that. No and drama. drama feels, oh my God. Right? <laughs> I remember wanting drama. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember before I did my therapy, I wanted yeah, right? drama. The drama you know, feels yeah. exciting and it yeah. feels like, no. wow, that's romantic. No, it no. is not. No, it is not ugh, right? Been there, done that. Exactly. So Leslie, tell us, tell us what's going on with the coffee club. Now you mentioned maybe going into a newsletter. Tell us about the present. Yeah, yeah. So Covey Club was born out of More Magazine. The idea was to take the More concept of, hey, what's next for you and show you all these possibilities, but make it digital because print doesn't work anymore. We can't afford it. It's too expensive. No, and that's why print is going out of business. There are no advertisers. Google and, and Facebook ate up all the advertising. And so Basically, we have original content, which are a lot of essays and great how-to pieces written by the same people who wrote for me at Moore and then others. We have teaching that we do a couple of times a week where we bring in people like you who came to talk <laughs> about dating. Um, but we're teaching everything from how to, you know, how to better do your LinkedIn page to how to write a resume today to... I mean, we'll do everything to do with lifestyle. We'll, you know, we'll talk about how to live a healthier life. We'll talk about menopause. I bring in menopause doctors, whatever it is that's on our minds, I'll bring in an expert. It's just an hour. We've been doing it virtually way before the pandemic. In fact, I was so happy that the pandemic got everybody onto Zoom. We've been doing Zoom for years before, but I always had to instruct at the beginning of each um, Zoom to say, here's your panel. Here's what you... Now I'm like, I threw that out. I'm like, I don't have to say that anymore. It's great. So we teach, um, we do live events. We're slowly bringing our live events back. I'm going to do a big event here in New Orleans in November. And um, we do a retreat every year. And then we'll probably do some regional stuff starting in 2022. People aren't really ready to, to come together yet um, completely. So we'll do that. And then I have a podcast, which is called Reinvent Yourself with Leslie Jane Seymour. And I've interviewed over 150 women now who talk about their reinvention stories. And it can, I mean, it can be anything. And it's not just career. It can be leaving a violent relationship. It can be losing 200 pounds. It can be, because reinvention can be all kinds of things. It can it can be, you know, being a, an empty nester and trying to figure out if you want to go back into the workspace and become an entrepreneur. It's all those kinds of reinventions. And um, what I've learned over the, I mean, there was a lot of interviews of those kind of people at more, but I didn't do them as podcasts. And really what you learn is that it really doesn't matter where you come from, how much money you have, what your background is, you can reinvent yourself. You just have to be clever about it. And you have to ask for help and you have to get a few tools. And some people reinvented themselves with very little money. Some people threw a lot of money at it, you know, it, it, because a lot of people say to me, oh, I have to save to do, it's not necessarily true, but you can do all kinds, you can, you can reinvent yourself while you're in a career that is winding down or you don't like, and you can two time it. And you can launch your reinvention on the side in the weekends at the, you know, or at night. There are so many ways to do it, but you have to have that mindset, Sandy. You have to have that mindset that I can do this. I'm worth it. I'm worth the time. I'm worth spending some money. That's one of the issues we see a lot is we see moms spending for the, you know, the ski equipment, the soccer team, but won't spring for, you know, a course for themselves or a mastermind to help get them in to the mindset or to get an accountability group together. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't spend on ourselves. We spend on everybody else, but not ourselves. 
So there's, there's some mind changing that has to go on. Um, but basically we come together as a group. We have some wonderful um, coaching sessions called Positive Mornings that we do every Monday morning from nine to 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have two reinvention coaches where we come in and they come in and give us a tool for the week and we share whatever the discussion is um, that we wanna talk about. Um, and it can be getting very deep on moving forward, what's holding you back, but we do it on a weekly schedule, which is great. And you've, that was where I saw this woman like move out of the stuck phase. Um, mm. And it's really very rewarding. I love what I do. I'm at that stage where we have to scale. Um, we didn't know what we were, I, to be honest. I didn't know I didn't know if I had anything. I didn't know if it was business. I didn't know, I, I didn't, you know, like you, I've never been an entrepreneur. So I was throwing spaghetti at the wall in the beginning. <laughs> now I know, like we did some deep research during the pandemic into our best consumers. And they really told us that, you know, without Covey Club, they would not have made it through the pandemic. Wow. And what we figured out is we are, I'm not a coach, but what I call myself is Google for women 40 plus, but analog. So what I do, and the reason why we call it Covey, Covey's a small group of birds. And we come together, we have a little nest, you come in, you're not sure what that next step is for you. We hold a place for you in that nest. I can't, I can't tell you what your reinvention is going to be. I can't make you do it, but I can give you all the tools, all the, I can put the experts in front of you. I can put edited tools in front of you. And then you decide what it is you're gonna use and how you're gonna move through. And we've had a lot of people come in, they, they, figure out what they're going to be by meeting new people and also meeting new people and having a group of women who don't already know you and want to stick you in a box that you grew up in. This is, I didn't realize how actually being in a nest with a bunch of strangers who want to support each other and they all end up doing business with each other. So we're business and friendship. That's how we're different. It's both. It's this wonderful virtual circle, but how that is so freeing because they don't know you as Jane who didn't know X, Y, Z. You come in and you're Jane with X, Y, Z. They don't, you know, they're willing to accept you that way. And then you can move out with the confidence that you, that you should have always been Jane with X, Y, Z. And so all these things I discovered um, while putting this together was one of those kind of crazy, if you build it, they will come kind of weird moments. And what I find as, as we get bigger, it gets better because we get more important input and more people from diverse backgrounds and more people giving. And what's really fabulous is everybody's older. They're all experts. I need a social media person help. I go to somebody in my club. She's, she's already done. She's like worked for all the top beauty companies. She's worked for top magazines. I hire her to be my consultant. Like, why would I go looking somewhere else? Like, and this is what everybody does. People hire people off the podcast, I found out. I was on a call the other day and everybody on the call had either hired somebody, worked with somebody, befriended somebody. They shared breeders for they, they saw one's dog on one, of the, on one of the video, you know, the Zoom cast. Now they're sharing breeders. <laughs> So it's like, it's just, you say, how can this happen virtually? It does. And then we do our live events where everybody's going to come together um, and uh, meet each other. We're going to do a, an event here in New Orleans in November, and then we'll start the bigger events. People want to wait till the spring of 22. So we'll have a big, we usually do a retreat to a spa. So much going on. Wow. I know it's crazy, right? It's crazy. It's, well, what I love about it is you, you had an audience, you, you had an audience and you had a direction with more magazine. And then you took that audience and you put it into a new channel and then right. it grew from there. Right. A lot of people start and don't, don't have any clue. And right. you still, I mean, you still were reinventing and, and figuring it out as you went. And I think that's an important thing for people to hear that oh, you didn't goodness. have all the pieces, right? We never do. Totally. And, right? So people totally. wait. They wait until they've had, you know, another six years of education. No. You just you just do it. And Sandy, I've fallen on my face a hundred times. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody told me in the beginning when I left publishing, 
because I have to make this a business. This is not a charity. If I'm going to do a charity, I'm going to do a real charity. I'm not going to do this. This is a business. Mm -hmm. And people said, no one will pay for just better content. And I came out of more, which had, you know, stellar award-winning content. I was like, maybe if I make more level content, they're going to pay for it. (laughs) No, I made my first, my first outing was I was, you're going to laugh. I was making a magazine a week fresh content. I was paying people the same amount of money that Vogue paid. I was illust- getting original illustrations. So I did my little research. I did this for two months and I then I surveyed my group and they loved it. It was beautiful. They got it was for them. They loved the writing there. I said, how much would you pay? They said $2. That's what I pay for my, uh, my Oprah. And I was like, $2? <laughs> First of all, I'm already in debt, like $20,000 now. And you want to pay me two? And I can't go up against Oprah. I'm dead. Like if I'm I'm dead right here. So like, I thought it was the end. I thought like I'm dead. And what was so interesting is I, um, I said, oh, well, you know, I always knew it was a club. I called it Covey Club for a reason. I knew it was something else. And I said, let me just lean into the club part of it. And what does a club mean? And I started exploring that and we went back into the club aspect of it. And we started doing our little stage interviews, which were done over video once a month. We would do those. I would have somebody important once a month. And now we teach three times a week, you know, so you're always, you know, you're always reinventing and you're always, and look, I stumble all the time. I fall on my face in front of my group here all the time. And what I love about them is you just get yourself up and you dust yourself off and you just come back at them and say, sorry, I didn't know that X, Y, Z was the wrong direction. Here's a survey, you know, tell me about blah, blah, blah. Cause I've, I've made mistakes like that where, you know, we were going to do a spa retreat, um, in this November in Texas. And I picked my friend who was with spas, helped me pick a place because we were in Arizona before those people weren't responding. And so we picked Texas. This is before the freeze. This is before we had a, we had to find a place. And of course, when I put the thing out, which was like a month ago, I had people come back to me. They were like, why did you pick Texas? I'm rethinking my cubby club thing. That's so outrageous. They're so, they're not treating COVID right now. Oh. And I was like, Oh, like it crossed my mind, but it, you know, I was like, I didn't realize that would be such a a big problem for people. And, um, you know, I felt like a turkey, but whatever, you know, and I went back at them and said, Hey, you know, we're going to think about better timing and maybe a different place. And, um, you know, and so now we're, they're going to come to new Orleans and then next year, we're not going to go to Texas. (laughs) And, um, because mostly they were afraid of, um, uh, it wasn't that they didn't want to be in Texas. They were afraid that they didn't take the virus seriously. Yeah. That there would be future issues with that, which was very interesting. So, yeah, but know. that's so what I love about that is, again, it's you throw spaghetti at the wall. You don't know until you try, but it's how you recover. And it's this is true recover. about everything. Always. I think it's, it Always. is because if you're so attached to, this is the thing that has to happen. Mm -hmm. And then you can't take the feedback, right? That's what people with a fixed mindset would do. They would, they would say, this is the way it has to be. And if you don't like it tough, you know, but you're like going, these are my people, I'm listening to them and I'm getting feedback. And that means I have to rethink this. And it's such an important part of entrepreneurship. I mean, I, I reinvented so many programs because they weren't working and you know you you put a lot of effort into it and then you pivot and go okay this is this is more resonant for people right now right let it go move on do something that works better so yeah that's it's it's just so important for people to hear this i think it's and you model for people in your club this is what entrepreneurship looks like this is what running a business looks like it's not all rainbows and unicorns at all. (laughs) And you don't don't know, and you make mistakes and you, um, you know, it is what it is. I mean, as we've learned, Sandy, I mean, you look, you know, I've been fired from one job. I've had, you know, two instances of jobs that were eliminated and closed. Um, We don't control any of that stuff. It's, it is how you respond to it. It's how you bounce back. 
And I remember halfway through being an editor in chief, I think it might have been of Mary Claire when I sat back and looked around and I thought, where were all those women who made it? They had made it before me. I was slow to the editor in chief area because I was really happy being a writer for a very long time. I really loved writing and I was happy with that. A lot of other people wanted to get to the top really fast. And then a lot of people exploded, they got fired, they had an affair with the top guy and they were pushed out. I mean, like there's like a thousand different stories, right? But they left the playing field. They never came back. Mm. And I remember when, you know, I got fired from Mary Claire because I was the monkey in the middle between two large companies that had never worked out their partnership. So it was a 50-50 partnership. And I was a ping pong ball. You know, the French would call me up and say, oh, we want to go upscale. And so blah, 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 blah. And then my boss would go like, we're going downscale. We're selling tons of stuff. Put that sex line on there. I want it to sell. And you'd be like, well, the French thought, I don't care about the French. And I was, they were in a 50-50 partnership, which I didn't understand. I didn't, I didn't understand. And I was the, I was the ping pong ball. I was the monkey in the middle, actually. And um, it's really, it's really difficult. Those things are, are hard situations. They're hard to recover from, but it is getting up again. I decided I was not going to be, I was not going to disappear after that. I was going to use it as a learning thing. And when you look at all the women who, and not just women, there's men out there, but I deal mostly with women. It is that resiliency. It is that when you get knocked down, how do you get back up? You know, it's like Michael Bloomberg got fired from, I guess it was Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs early on. They said he was never going to be a success, right? How many people, I remember Richard Gere. I remember early on in my career hearing that Richard Gere was told by a modeling agency that he just didn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay. how do they know? Right? Right. They don't know. Yeah. And so you have to, you know, persistence. And I know we've used this word before in polit politics and everything. And hanging in there is there's a huge, huge, huge lesson, especially as we get older, in being persistent and hanging in there. And there are many times with Covey when I wake up and I think like, oh, my God, I'm not going to make it this way. And I'm like, you know what? Just persist. Yeah. Hang in there, see where it takes you. You don't know, you don't have an answer on that. Don't make a prejudgment. And you'd be shocked at how far that can take you. And you have to stick with these things longer than you think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, I mean, I, and I'll tell you this from all the writing I did at Vogue and everywhere, how many celebrities I interviewed. And the first the first thing out of their mouth would be, yes, I'm a 20 year overnight sensation. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. 20 years I've been working on this, but yeah. yes, I'm happy to be known for this now. I'm so glad I finally made it, but it's been 20 years. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't usually happen quickly for anybody. Yeah. What I talk about is always having a reinvention in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. And anybody who doesn't in today's world, which moves so fast, is foolish yeah. and you should have a year's worth of your salary in your bank somewhere that you could live off of. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone around and done this conversation and there will always be some women that come up to me and they go, well, I've been with this bank on the bank I've been 25 years, they love me. It's like, I'm like, that's great until the bank gets bought and it does and the bank gets moved to Anchorage. It's not about you, it's about what happens right. and you need to be prepared. And what I always say is have that preparation for a second act in your back pocket, have some money, have something else that you've learned or studied or that you, that you think you might like to do in the future. Also, because we are living longer, you're gonna, if you're smart and intelligent, you're gonna get freaking bored with that other thing. It just gets boring. And yes. you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna want to do something else. And if lo and behold, you end up being a lawyer for the rest of your life, and you die with the law degree, <laughs> buy yourself a house, <laughs> buy yourself a car with the money, but have it there. So in case something happens to you, that is out of your control, or you decide, I don't want to do this anymore. You have the ability to walk away. 
And that's, I mean, that is one of the advantages I had when I started Cubby Club was that I could say, okay, I'm going to, I put away enough money. And if, you know, I, I'm going to choose here between what I'm going to do next, I thought it was going to be sustainability, but I'm going to give this, you know, this entrepreneurial thing a, a chance. And I was able to do it because I put away enough money, but I knew that I was very aware and very honest with myself that publishing was in trouble. Yeah. There were a lot of people who, I don't know if they were really shocked or, or unable to be honest with themselves about an industry in decline. And when I went into this industry in my 20s, who would have thought magazines would go out of business? Right. Like, you could have, I mean, I laughed you off the stage if you told me that, right? Yeah. I mean, who would have, that's like saying, I mean, that's like saying we don't go to movies anymore and they're going to be streamed into your house. How ridiculous. Right. Or we're going to talk on video right. on our phones. I'm like, going to have a watch that it, I can talk on my phone like, right. you know, Dick Tracy did. Like, right. that's ridiculous. Right. But you don't know. So you need to protect yourself. You need to um, make sure that you have something else that you love. And that you've thought about and that you could possibly launch into in the future. Because the future, as we used to say at More Magazine, we used to say that you may be given the opportunity to reinvent yourself. Yeah. And, you know, the, the one thing that's constant is change. That's and right. And people who resist change end up stuck. I mean, that's, and I, I right. you're reminding me of the quote about luck is preparation meets opportunity or whatever I'm probably butchering it but it yes. is it's it's yes. all about you need to be prepared and then the opportunity comes and you are ready and I remember hearing that from one of my coaches and I started to prepare like here's the bio here's 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 the list of questions I'll answer on an interview here's where you know I can I can fit myself into whatever opportunity comes up because I am ready and many people just don't take the time to get ready. So I love this. I love this well, conversation. It's exhausting. It's yeah. exhausting to be ready and it's painful <laughs> to be ready, but you need to be ready. And in many cases, I say, please come and listen to all this stuff two years before you need it, because that gives you a two year runway. Yeah. Do your, do your work on your personal brand. We talk a lot about that. We have a lot of information um, at Covey Club about that. All those foundational things. Make sure your LinkedIn is up to date. May all that stuff, get it done, have it, so you don't have to spend a year doing all that groundwork. Right. And, and then you're prepared. And look, again, if nothing happens, so you got a great LinkedIn, yeah. you know? You've got like a great bio and, you know, for when you write a book or whatever, but right. don't you never leave. know. You don't know, and it is exhausting and you know, people are so overwhelmed. They're like, oh my God, who needs another job, which is thinking about what's next. Right, but, but you the, can also pace it. You don't have to do it. That's all right. Time. And better to pace it and, um, and to not be forced to do it all at once. Yeah, I agree. All right, well, we're heading into the lightning round. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. I'm always <laughs> okay. ready. Okay. Uh, fill in the blank. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. That I wasn't clever enough. I was told, you know, I wasn't strong enough, that I was like too nice and that was going to be the end of me, that I couldn't get, you know, get to where I wanted to be. And um, they told me that at Vogue. And um, <laughs> I left there and, and decided I just, I have to be me. I can't be, I can't be anybody else. So I'm going to have to deal with this. I like being a nice person. I'm sure, look, there are people I had a fire or whatever in my course of my career, probably have voodoo dolls of me around. But in general, I've always believed in making the best of other people. That's That's been my secret sauce. And because that's what I want people to do for me. But I, I was told I was never going to make it because of that. The nice girl can make it if she, yes. <laughs> right? And you I, have to I be think tough. there's- yeah, so there's a, there's a great book called the myth, the myth of the Nice Girl. Do you know that book? I don't, no. I, oh, interviewed, the, I interviewed the author on this podcast, Fran Hauser. Oh, and, oh um, Fran, yes, yes, yeah. yes, I know you her. Know yes, Fran. I did that. Yes, I forgot that was the name of it, yes. Yeah, so Fran 
actually reminds me a little of you because yeah. she was in publishing and she was at People Magazine and and so many times she was asked to do things or you yeah. know who was treated with with disrespect and oh yeah she was able to speak up and say you know what if you want to get the best out of me don't treat me that way yeah. and you know people it was a, it was a boys club you know oh, it was mostly yeah. a boys club and so she had to learn to assert herself but never lose the niceness i mean she's right. such a sweetheart yeah 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 and that's really hard to be nice in business and make it's really tough yeah you have to have because boundaries. the men really don't respect you they walk all over you they think you know they think they can yeah what was the number one thing holding you back from becoming a woman of value i feel like we just answered that but mm. <laughs> I had a pretty rotten childhood and two screwed up parents. So I had to really do my work. I really had, um, I didn't have any support. And so I had to find my own family. I created my own family and my kids and my family and my husband were always my biggest cheering section. And um, that was the real, that was the real thing was mm -hmm. finding another and realizing that my childhood was not my destiny. Yeah, that's another myth that right. I think people who have a fixed mindset say, well, that's that's the way it is. It was the way I was born. I can't help it. You know, I came from this, so I'm doing this. And I remember having a conversation with my mom about martyrdom. And man, did I hate the whole martyr victim thing. And so I, mm -hmm. I was talking to her about it. And so she said, well, I can't help it. I, I come from a long line of martyrs. My grandmother, my mother, we were all martyrs. And I said, yeah, mm -hmm. I had the same line. <laughs> mm -hmm. I broke the chain, mom. You can break it too. Like it's not, that's not your destiny just because you were born into it and it's all you knew. So yeah, really important. Keep keep that in mind, listeners. Yeah, no, and, and, along, and along that line, my this wonderful first therapist I had, and this was a huge aha moment for me, was I was, you know, career girl, I was going to be Mary Tyler Moore, I wasn't going to get married, I wasn't going to have a family. And he said to me, do you want to have kids? And I said to him, why would anybody do that? Like, what a horrible idea. My childhood was just awful. And he said, you know, you don't have to do it the way they did it. I know it sounds so stupid. And I was like this. I was like, I don't. It was the biggest light bulb that went off. And when I realized I could do it my own way mm -hmm. and I have a family and I have fabulous kids and a great family. I mean, I have the family I always wanted and I didn't yeah. have, but I didn't know that. Yeah, I know it and sounds so stupid. But, no, it really know. doesn't. It doesn't. It's, it's so common that people yes. who grow up in that kind of environment decide not to have children yeah, because absolutely. they believe that that is what child rearing will be. And that's huh. why would you do that to a child? Huh. And I'm glad that person said something to you because it's so true. It's like, you get to change the legacy. You get right. to make a difference. That's right. You I'm glad change. you did. Yeah, you can change the direction. Mm -hmm. And you're never too late to change direction. Yes. So you can do that now, even if you're in the second part of your life. You know, there are a lot of women, and I'm sure you meet them too, Sandy, who feel like, well, I'm too old. I can't make a change now. Yeah. I can't, I can't make up for anything. Bullshit. Not true. No. You can repair almost anything if you want to. Yeah. And um, it's, it really honestly is never too late. The only time it's too late is, you know, the hour you're on your deathbed. You've yeah. got between here and there, <laughs> make something of it. Change what you want. Be who you want. Go a different direction. Everything you did before, you can't erase it, but you can change what comes after. You know? Yeah, absolutely. People need to believe that. Um, it's so, true. Yeah, it's true. I it's really true. totally agree. I mean, that's the motto of, of last first date is it's never too late to have the right. life you want. I mean, it is right. never too late. What is the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? I think you've got to know yourself. If you don't know yourself, you will never be empowered. And until you have done some self work, whether with a coach or therapy or reading books or whatever, you are, 
you know, you're the shell on the beach with the waves coming in until you know yourself and you can say, I'm the crab actually, and I'm going to walk away from the shore. Mm. I'm not the shell being pushed around. And, um, and then it gives you the ability, it gives you the ability to deal with everything because everybody, everybody from work to your family brings their crap to the table. And if you don't know what your crap is, they'll mix their crap with your crap and blame it all on you. And what you oh, have yeah. to be able to do is say, no, 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 no. Here are my, I know my bad qualities are this, this, and this. That's not it. That's on you. You have to figure out why you're behaving that way. That's not me. That's you. And that gives you the empowered ability. And I found that in work too. I worked with a lot of very creative people and creative people often can be a little crazy. They're, you know, they are more id than, you know, ego. And so you're dealing, that's why they're so creative. I know that sounds like an old stereotype, but actually over after many, 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 many years, um, I did come to believe that they really, it's a lot of emotional reactions and to manage those people, you have to really know, like, this is a comment from your act crazy. Like I'm loving you up here and you're telling me that I'm ignoring you and blah, blah, blah. It's not true. Like, so go home, figure it out, come back and we'll talk. Mm. But you need to have, you need to know who you are. If you yeah. don't, that will I'll open you up for a lot of pain because you'll be accepting everybody's, perception of you yeah you know and you need to know not everybody's right they're no. wrong you get to decide who you are not everybody else right. deciding who you are or what your value is and sometimes they're wrong yes they're often, wrong often they're wrong right because right. they're they're projecting their own insecurities on you right. like you said and it's so it's important right. to delineate the difference you know and what's what's on my side of the street and what's on yours and you know we right. take care of our side not each other's sides so uh, that's such an important lesson i love the idea that the analogy of the crab walking away instead of oh. being knocked ashore because yeah it's it's really true i felt like that little shell my whole life until i did my work wow you know and then i walked away yeah a little crab you <laughs> <laughs> so leslie what advice would you give to your younger self to know that what i was going through was not the whole world and you know that once i got out of where i was and myself and that point of view that the world might see me differently and um it was pretty torturous as a teenager and all that stuff and relying on what your parents said about you or thought about you and i wish that you know it would have been a very hard thing to absorb at 13 to understand you have two crazy parents like they're nuts <laughs> both of them so crazy attracts crazy i know i know you think you've got like you got one bad one but they're both bad they're both nuts um and uh once I realized that, then, then my life became immediately better. Mm -hmm. But that's really hard to understand as a kid. You know, yeah. you take what they say as gospel. You know, I grew up with a mother telling me that I was too, you know, I was too outspoken. I was bossy. I was going to come to a bad end for that, you know. You know, and I love Sheryl Sandberg's thing, which is bossy is just means you have management potential. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's true. I agree. I used it's to, you true. know, you it's talked not about bad. Right. You talked about your daughter asserting herself at a young age oh, yeah. with her no. Yeah. And I had a daughter like that too. And I I for a long time, many years, I was like, Oh, she's so stubborn, she's oppositional. And then oppositional. I thought, okay, she's she's headstrong she's headstrong, like you right. can really reframe it because she right. is and she and it's gotten her very far in life but if i had continued right. with that rhetoric of you are stubborn stop being so stubborn you're not listening right. to me right. that is a bad message for a child right, right? right. so celebrate right. yeah they still have to listen but you can celebrate right. their strengths um right. two more questions and we're sure. done so sure. what is something that people often get wrong about you leslie that they think I, I figured it all out, which I haven't. Um, I'm always surprised when people think I've 
I'm further along than I am. <laughs> I think I figured out some things, but not everything. For some mm. reason, I guess my facade looks a little more together than it really is. And I'm guessing that's for most people too. Yeah. And finally, how would you like to be remembered? I want to matter, and I know I do, and I know I have, and it's been very rewarding to have a career like that and have a great family. I know I mattered to them. And um, what I like is that I have a life where I can matter to other people too, in a very positive way. And that makes me feel good. That's where I get my, my um, juju comes from, seeing other people get to where they want to be. And, um, and because I feel I have the power to do that, I like to do that. I just hope that people will look at me as a change agent, a personal change agent. I'm not like, you know, discovering an app that can help you get a date. But um, that kind of personal change agent that can make people comfortable to get to where they have to go. That's something that makes, it makes me feel really good. And for whatever reason, I find myself in that space. And that's what Cubby Club's all about. And um, we're making it happen. I can't tell you how rewarding that is. It's just one person at a time. Maybe it's three people in, in a month. I'd like it to get bigger because I would like to do that for more people all at once. But, um, and I learn as I go. What was so interesting is somebody wrote, one of our members wrote to us the other day and she said, you know, I'm so grateful to Covey Club because you gave me the opportunity and the courage to go back and speak to this person who was, who was holding me back. And I finally had that conversation. It wasn't pleasant, but I had it. I now feel like I can move forward. I don't know where I'm headed, but I feel like I've let go of the past. And I get goosebumps as I even say that because I was mm -hmm. like, it was a dawning of an idea for me where I was like, oh, so literally we can we can just hold a space for you you just sometimes you just need a space that other people hold for you while you figure it out and we can't figure it out for you but we you know that that terror of people who are you know and i've been let go from your job and the next day you're like do i put on my makeup do i put on my high heels do i stay in my pajamas what do I, like that that horrible unknown if i can be that space where you can come to us and say don't put on your shoes don't put on your makeup come here be yourself we'll figure out when you're going to put on your shoes and your makeup again and it may be a year from now and that's okay there's a huge value in that and that is what the covey is mm. and i didn't even know it <laughs> that's what it is if you think yeah. of it as a nest that's what it is well, there's so many great takeaways from this conversation. Just basically, it ain't over till it's over. And it ain't over till you right? say it's over. <laughs> till you say it's That's over. That's right. Till you say no it's over. No one else gets to decide. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's so many steps that people can take to create positive change in their lives, to reinvent themselves no matter how old they are. That's right. And you've shared so many inspirational ways that people can do it. You yourself has, have come from a very difficult past in mm -hmm. many ways, not just mm -hmm. your childhood home, but your many jobs that you've pivoted. Oh my and God, been let go stuff. of, and, and even with Covey Club, it, it didn't start out as one thing. It became many things. And, and you, you were able to be open along the way, which is a wonderful leader to have for this wonderful organization where people can come and be supported in this little nest. Yep. So, yeah. So thank you so much. And um, tell you, people, Sandy. Uh, oh, you're welcome. How, how can people find you? I know we, I have many links that I'll put up yes. in the show notes, but what's like one of the best ways to find you? Well, come to coveyclub.com, which is www.coveyclub.com. And it's C-O-V-E-Y. Covey is a small group of birds. And then also follow us on social media. You can find us you know, Covey Club on, um, on Instagram, on Facebook. And then I have a crazy Instagram, which if you have a sense of humor, you will enjoy. It has nothing to do with my brand. I just became a memer during the pandemic <laughs> because <laughs> I have to laugh. I just have to laugh. I had a laugh, I mean, I was gonna cry. So you just go to Leslie J. Seymour and it's L-E-S-L-E-Y, J. Seymour. 
And um, that's my Instagram account. And it has nothing to do with anything, but it'll make you laugh. And I get a big kick out of that. And um, and then, of course, we have our LinkedIn page. Um, and uh, and Cubby Club really is come to the um, podcast if you're thinking of reinventing, which is Reinvent Yourself with Leslie Jane Seymour. And that's everywhere. And we're approaching 100,000 downloads. So we're getting awesome. there slowly. And you can pick and choose who you want to learn from. Thank you so much. And continue. You, good luck with your wonderful organization. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.